Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to another Wine with Jimmy video. This is for the WSET Level 3 certificate and this is looking at the growing environment and this is talking about heat and this will be actually split into three parts. So this is the free part, one available to everyone on YouTube, parts two and three will only be available on the Wine with Jimmy online portal, www.winewithjimmy.com, the e-learning portal. Um, if you do have any comments, questions, or concerns, please get in touch via any of the social media at the bottom of each slide, or you can leave a comment in the YouTube video section below this, or get in touch via the Wine with Jimmy website. So let's rock and roll. This is all found in chapter five of your textbooks, but I'll bring it to life. In your textbook, it's just some words and we'll have some lovely pictures. Here is a very beautiful picture of Piemonte Barolo, where you'll see um, the wonderful rolling fog across the Monferrato Hills. Beautiful landscape. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about fogs later on because this is all about heat. Uh, so heat is of absolute fundamental importance for vineyards. Uh, if it is too cold, the vine will not grow or it will struggle to survive. So it is absolutely imperative that the heat is correct and it's enough for the vine A to grow and have a growth season, but also B for a dormancy as well. So there needs to be the disparity of heat between seasons, which we'll talk a little bit about. Okay, so here we go then. So um, what a vine needs, first of all, then we'll go into the specific factors that affect heat. So the vine needs heat for a successful growth season, as we just mentioned, and it needs to be normally above 10 degrees Celsius. That's what we've got those little arrows on the left hand side. Um, if it does drop below that, the vine believes it's going into its dormancy. Um, so therefore, if you don't have these regular temperatures above 10 degrees C for an extended period of time, you will not be able to ripen your grapes. So you'll need um, prolonged periods from spring to autumn above 10 degrees Celsius to maintain that growth season. Um, and also heat, the actual availability of heat and what kind of heat is, is, is available for the vineyard, for the vine, will determine what varieties will grow where. Uh, so that's reason, there's reasoning behind certain varieties. You know, you won't find things like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot in places like England, for instance. Um, it really is all about that heat factor. So it's a determining factor, really, in what you can grow. And the big sort of comparison, really, to, to give you is things like Riesling versus Grenache. Riesling as a variety, yes, it loves a lot of sunlight, but it actually doesn't need the world's greatest amount of heat. It loves being a cool climate variety. Um, it, uh, it buds quite late uh, and it survives the very cold winters, the bitter cold winters as well. So it does really well. It goes through a good dormancy and survives and then can survive in the sunny but cooler conditions of summers in places like Germany and Austria, for instance. So it needs less heat. Grenache, on the other hand, which is a thin-skinned black grape variety, which hails from Spain originally and now is grown very much across the Mediterranean, but in other places like Australia as well. Grenache is a heat-loving grape variety, absolutely loves those conditions where there's plenty of heat and even can survive in drought conditions. So often you'll find only Grenache really in the Northern Hemisphere, or let's actually say in Europe, only really um, below the 45 degree parallel. So that's kind of the line that goes just north of Avignon. Uh, and you find Grenache below that. So in the south of France, in some parts of the southwest, places like Sardinia, and then of course, like Spain, for instance. Um, so it absolutely needs the, the, that heat behind it. Um, so that's a little bit on what the vine needs. Let's go into the factors that uh, can affect heat. So what key factors can change 
the heat in our certain areas, be it macro climates or micro climates? Well, first of all, quite macro based is latitude. Um, so here we have a, a rough map of the world. And there may be a few mistakes on this, but don't worry about it so much. It's giving you an overview of um, those two bands that are found across the world in terms of latitude. That is 30 and 30 to 50 north and then 30 to 50 south. So most vines will be found within these latitudes. Um, so the vine requires minimum temperatures for its growth season, as we know, uh, but it also needs the dormancy period in winter. And that's why many vines will lie between these two latitudes. It gets really the perfect full seasonal effect in these areas. And yes, some of you will be looking at this and going, well, there are vineyards in China. There are vineyards in India. There are vineyards in Mexico, Bolivia. Um, yes, that's true. They are not hailed as the finest of regions. They are quite emerging. There are some wonderful wines being made in some of those areas today. Uh, but we still generally say 30 to 50. And also, if you think about Britain, um, so if you go uh, above London, it's 51 degree north. So therefore, you are looking at uh, outside of that range. And as we know today, England is making some very fine wine, certainly at the sparkling line. Um, so 30 to 50 degree north, 30 and 50 degree south. Um, as you go towards zero, which is the equator, of course, this gets much hotter as the sun's energy has much less distance to travel. Uh, so there's much more heat found in these areas. And that's, of course, why we tend to find mainly in these zones things like tropical conditions, very hot and humid tropical conditions, or desert-like conditions like the Sahara, for instance, uh, and places like Kenya, etc. So you'll find very, very um, hot uh, conditions, which is far too much uh, intensity for the vine to survive. And then as you go towards the north and the south of, uh, of, of, of the world, you'll find the poles, where of course it's far too cold and the temperatures are regularly below 10 degrees C and of course does not give any kind of season for the vine to survive. Um, so latitude of course affects the, um, the heat. Now we will talk a little bit of latitude and sunlight on future sessions. Um, it's a little bit different but we're just talking about heat at this section. Then we find altitude affecting heat as well. Uh, and it's very simple, this one. As you gain in altitude, you decrease in the heat and in the temperature. So therefore, um, well, it's normally around every 100 meters you rise, you, you, you lose about 0.5 to 0.6 degrees C um, on average during the, the, the season. So um, it's, uh, it does decrease as you go up in altitude. And I'm giving you an example here, which is cited in your textbook as well. Uh, and this is a cross section of um, northern Argentina. And this is the Salta province, uh, which has on that green line, Cafayate. And Cafayate is famous for the white grape called Torontes. Um, Cafayate, as you can see, is grown at around 2,000 meters of altitude. And actually, if you had head up towards Molinos and then Cachi at the northern end, you are talking up to 3,000. So this sits between sort of 2,000 to 3,000 meters in altitude. This is exceptionally high in altitude. Um, but we are actually at 26 degrees south. So we're actually outside of the latitude zones we've just talked about going towards the equator and actually if we put this in reference to uh, the same latitude but in Africa we are talking about um, Morocco, southern Morocco, Algeria, Libya going towards of course the heat and the desert-like conditions that you find within North Africa. Um, so really, this area should be the same, but it's not due to that altitude. In fact, if you do go towards the east here, it does become more desert-like in Argentina. But this is the mountainous area to the west of Argentina, bordering Chile, of course. And this is where this altitude comes into play. It 
really creates conditions where we can cultivate the vine and even cultivate, cultivate white grapes very successfully like Dorontes. So it provides us cooler growing conditions and enables white grape varieties as well to be cultivated. Uh, so altitude affecting heat, of course. Then we have oceanic currents, of which um, there are many, but they're only really mentioning three in your textbooks. And have, I've got these three as examples here for you. Uh, so um, oceans, oceans carry currents, large, massive, massive currents, uh, which uh, can carry, depending on their, um, their original point, can carry warm or cool um, air with them. So the Benguela current, as you see here on this map, is a current that affects South Africa. This is a map of South Africa, uh, and this is um, of the Western Cape, in fact. Uh, so this is a part of our uh, um, uh, South Africa. So this is the Western Cape, and you'll off the south of this map to the bottom of the map, you will have Antarctica. Uh, so any kind of air mass which is coming from the south, from Antarctica, will be bringing cool air. The current is cooler. So this cool air is actually what, when it affects South Africa, it's called the Benguela current. And this affects many places like Walker Bay, False Bay, Cape Town, all of these coastal areas along the Western Cape. So that's all these kind of areas. Let me get my uh, arrow ready down here. Should have got it ready earlier, shouldn't I? But here, places like uh, Walker Bay, uh, places like False Bay, places like Cape Town, they all get affected, of course, very intensively by the Benguela current. And it, in fact, drops the average temperatures along that coastal, coastal areas by quite a few degrees. Um, so, of course, this means that the heat is decreased. Uh, and this means that you have cooler conditions for the vine to survive. And certain vine species which don't like hot conditions, like Pinot Noir, for instance, cultivate very well in places like Walker Bay. So that is the Benguela current, which affects South Africa. There are others that affect South Africa. There's a wind called the um, Cape Doctor as well, but we're not mentioning that here. Um, Chile, the other famous one, is another one that is fed by the Antarctic, and that is the Humboldt current, which affects Chile. Uh, this is joined by the Western Drift of the Pacific, uh, and this cool air is what will touch areas of most of the regions and certainly most of the coastal ranges, famously places like Casablanca, San Antonio, Leda, but many of them are affected by the Humboldt current. So that means uh, otherwise a very warm place is moderated by the Humboldt current and once again prov providing more balanced conditions for viticulture and the possibility of cultivating white grapes like Sauvignon Blanc, which is actually quite important in Chile, certainly in places like Casablanca, San Antonio, and Leda. So that's the Humboldt current. So both of those you'll notice were in, in blue arrows as they had a cooling effect. Um, here is a map of Europe, uh, and we are just going to talk briefly about the Gulf Stream, which does not originate from a cold place like Antarctica, but originates from the tropics uh, and sort of the Central America area. Uh, and this comes across the Atlantic, warm air and wet. And this is what warms up many parts of Western Europe, including the United Kingdom, France, Spain, uh, north parts of Spain, Portugal. So this brings wetter weather. This brings warmer conditions as well. So you may notice if you are in the United Kingdom or somewhere along the western part of France, you will notice that when it's um, very bitterly cold, beautiful sunny skies in winter, but very bitterly cold and, and even snowing and, and so on, that is when the Gulf Stream will not be affecting this area. But when you've got those winter nights and days which are very muggy, sorry, not muggy, very wet and, and uh, very sort of drizzly and continually, but mild, that's the Gulf Stream effect in this area. So that actually warms up these regions, which otherwise may be too cool for viticulture, like the United Kingdom, for instance. So that's the oceanic current effect. We've also got fogs, which will affect certain areas. Uh, so fogs are um, developed when uh, cold air meets warm air. 
And here you have California's Napa Valley. Um, it is just Napa Valley in its entirety, but you'll have to the south of it is the San Pablo Bay. And if you follow the San Pablo Bay out to the Pacific, you see the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so the Pacific is the source of cooler air, and that's by that uh, big blue sea at the bottom of the map. And that finds its way up into the southern part of Napa Valley, off the San Pablo. But what's trapped inside the um, heat trapped zone of the Napa bench is a lot of hot air. Uh, and when that cold air heats, uh, meets the hot air, fogs will start to develop and roll in across these areas. So in fact, it means that these zones, which um, otherwise wouldn't be, be able to produce high quality grapes, can actually aid in the production of high quality grapes. Um, they provide cooling conditions. They often refresh the vineyards every morning during summer, late summer, um, when it's otherwise will get far too hot and you'll only have workhorse grapes with which high yield. You can actually grow very many quality grapes here, like Cabernet Sauvignon, for instance. It also helps protect acidities and makes them fresher. Very classic mark of a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon is its fresh acidity. So fogs, um, other areas famous for fogs, there is uh, this picture just here. This is the Camachasa fog, which affects many parts of um, Chile. And this is in Casablanca Valley. Uh, so that provides those cooling conditions as well off the Pacific. You will find fogs in Piemonte. My holding picture at the start of the presentation was of the Monferrato Hills near Borolo. Um, and that uh, is, is classic. Uh, as you get the cool air coming off the Alps, meeting the warm air that comes from the Ligurian Sea, a part of the Mediterranean. So it's a reverse to what we've actually just been talking about with Casablanca and Napa uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of where the cold and the hot air comes from, but a similar sort of uh, key uh, in, um, point in terms of the heat is important there. And then soil. So, um, Soil and geology is mightily important. Please do have a look at, uh, on the YouTube channel, have a look at the um, how geology affects wine. So geology and wine by me, it's about a 30, 30 40 minute video, uh, which is much more in depth. It's much more in depth than you'll need to know. So it's above your pay grade for the WSET level three, but it goes into much more detail. And uh, the geologist in me likes to go into detail, but I will refrain at this point because I'm just going to tell you what you need to know. Um, so you've got a picture here of the Mosul in Germany, the Middle Mosul, and you'll see these nice large angular black um, soils here which are slate and you'll find that that is a common thing that you'll find across the Mosul and the Rheingau. Um, we know Germany is a cold climate, mostly. There's a couple of changes where it's got a little bit warmer in recent years, but normally a cold climate. So Riesling is aided um, with a bit of warmth, certainly by the, the rocks that we have here. And you can see they're big rocks, they're big masses of slate. And this apps is really important for two reasons. Any kind of large mass of rocks and stones and pebbles, a little bit like, say, the pudding stones or the galley roule of Chateauneuf de Pape, um, they're quite, they can be quite large and they can absorb the heat very well. They act as a big, nice storage heater. So any large rocks, things like licorella, which is slate in Priorat, uh, things like the galley roule in Chateauneuf de Pape, slate here, granite of northern Rhone and so on. So large masses of rocks can absorb the heat. Also, the colour of the rocks are quite important. Um, if they are darker, so if you're looking at black or blue slate, as if you've got in this, um, in this picture, um, and dark rocks again, dark pebbles like the Galle Roule can be, then these will also absorb the heat better and re-radiate that into the vineyard much better. Um, in comparison to, say, a more chalky or white limestone-based soil, which tend to not absorb the heat so well and reflect, reflect the light a little bit more. So, um, so this is very important, absolutely critical in cooler climates, for instance. Um, 
But on the counter of that, I've got a picture here of a soil of a vineyard which is very clay based. You can see it here. There's lots of water retention in this soil. Uh, and that is quite important because soils with high water content or uh, that tend to retain water quite well, certainly things like clay, um, these take more energy to warm up. Uh, and they also tend to conduct heat from the vine to warm up uh, than dry soils. Um, and this, of course, can delay bud burst. As it's trying to warm up the vine getting towards spring, it's going to actually take longer than a warmer, drier soil. Uh, so, um, so that's important to realize. Clay, low loam soils, quite fertile soils, may have a delay in bud burst due to the fact that they have more water in them and the sun's energy needs to warm more things up, more mass, and that's including that water. Uh, so that's important as well. And then we have aspect. So you need to understand that aspect is the direction of the slope. And this is important because, of course, this means in what kind of direction that it faces. So uh, with this, um, you have got a little part of a compass here on this picture uh, and it's got not every part of it, but it's got most of it from west, south to east and including the other points southwest and southeast as well. Uh, so those vineyards that tend to face the equator, which in the northern hemisphere is south and then vice versa, in the southern hemisphere, they will gain much more solar radiation, much more heat. Um, so a south facing vineyard in the northern hemisphere will have much more heat behind it. Uh, they're often classified as uh, sunny sites and warming sites and so on in Europe. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. Let's just elaborate that a little bit. We're going to stay in the northern hemisphere. Um, just remember to flip it round for the southern hemisphere. But if you um, have a look at east facing and southeast facing, then, then you will have a slightly cooler conditions because this links into sunlight, which we mention on a future session as well. But um, the sun with east facing, that's when it's capturing the sun as it's rising and it's a more gentle morning sun. And as you know, in the morning, uh, it generally is a little bit cooler. So you will have cooler conditions normally in that vineyard and you'll have a little bit more of a, a gentle sun. Compare that to southwest and west, certainly southwest, that's going to get much warmer conditions as the sun is at its zenith uh, and you'll get much more um, sunlight as well. So there can be big differences in the direction of your slope. I think for me, the greatest grape variety as a major variety uh, as an example, is Pinot Noir. In the Northern Hemisphere, such as Burgundy, um, most Burgundy will actually, let me get my arrow out again, I'll get it in, I'll do this in red. Um, most of the vineyards face this kind of way in Burgundy East um, towards Southeast, most of them. Um, one of the beautiful things, it's enough sunlight to ripen Pinot Noir, which is a very fickle grape variety, but it's an elegant, gentle ripening. So that's why you get beautiful purity behind Pinot Noirs in Burgundy. But in Burgundy, when you come to the southern part of the Côte d'Or, uh, which is where it starts to turn around, around the villages of Morange and Santenay, which aren't villages on your syllabus, but it's interesting to know, it tends to then start to face south, and in some instances, southwest. It's only a small part of the Côte d'Or. Uh, and that's why the Pinot Noir that is found there, certainly around Morange and Santenay, are riper. They're often sweeter, often kind of liqueur red fruit instead of fresh red fruit, and very noticeable. Yes, there's many other things with Pinot Noir in, turn, in, in terms of the type of clone, the type of soil, drainage, altitude, so on and so on. But just on this point, this does have a part to play as well. So aspect, is mightily important in terms of the heat aspects behind it. So that concludes our first part. We will be talking in part two about continentality and diurnal ranges. And in part three, we'll be talking about 
um, the hazards around uh, uh, heat. So things like spring frosts, for instance, um, very intense winters uh, and a, a lack of sort of heat during the growing season. So I do hope you found this useful. Um, if you do have any comments, questions or concerns, please do get in touch via the social media or comments on this video on YouTube or get in touch via the wonderful e-learning portal, which is winewithjimmy.com, which is a must sign up for all of you that have got your level three examinations. Uh, but until then, if you find yourselves in London, please do come and see me for a class, a glass or a bottle at my bar, Stratton Wine House or the school, West London Wine School, South London Wine School. But until then, it's been a pleasure. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye. Thank you.